Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski. Today we'll be taking a look at the tabletop role-playing game Robert E. Howard's Conan by Modiphius Entertainment, published in 2017 after a successful Kickstarter campaign. The game uses the 2D20 system, which is pretty different than other games that I've played. My first experience with it was with the free RPG day adventure The Pit of Catalu, which includes free quick start rules, and I gave a review of that adventure in the quick start rules then. It was a huge hit with my players, but I also expressed a few concerns about the rules, but I added that since this was kind of a shortened down quick start version of the full rule set, the rules are probably a lot more clear once you got the full size rule book. But the game did grow grab our interest enough that we eventually did pick up the full rule set as well as some additional books for the game. We've now played several adventures with it and I have some reviews up for those. And now that we've got some good playtime under our belts, let's go ahead and talk about the game itself. Now, this review is going to be difficult for me to do. I've been putting it off because of that, because there is so much about this game and its presentation that I love. Absolutely love. But at the same time, there's a good deal here that we don't, which has made this game really difficult to recommend to people, because while so much of Conan is what is best in life, simultaneously a good portion of it isn't. All you need to start playing is one book, this giant 420 page wrist straining rule book. It has everything that you need in order to start playing. Now first, let's go ahead and talk about this book. It is beautiful. It is hands down some of the best art that I've ever seen in an RPG book, and it is packed with art. Modiphius got some amazing artists, including Braum, who I've been a fan of since Dark Sun, all to bring Howard's world to life. And not just the art, but the world of Howard's Conan is evident throughout the entire book. It doesn't feel like Modiphius took some generic fantasy role-playing system and just kind of tacked that onto Howard's world and called that Conan. No, the world and the mood of Howard's stories is evident throughout the entire book. It's woven in very well, and they did a wonderful job with it. Modiphius hired Howard scholars and experts on Conan and the love and respect which they showed the source material is apparent throughout the entire game. Character creation. Conan is a skill-based game, meaning that there's no levels or character classes like you'll find in other fantasy games out there. Instead of classes, we get several archetypes. But since they're not classes, you could have an entire group of a single archetype and all the characters would still be extremely unique from one another. Since players create their characters by building off specific skills, this allows for an incredible amount of diversity potential as far as what characters they can have and what they can make, and it's just a wide array of different options available to them. The character creation chapter itself is amazing. Either through rolling randomly or allowing your players or game master to choose, the player can create just a wide array of characters with rich backstories that are all tied directly into the world of Conan itself. Now, most games that allow for an option where you can roll absolutely everything randomly, uh, there's usually a few spots where certain things might might not quite fit together as well, you know, some combinations feeling a bit too random. But not Conan. With Conan, rolling up your characters completely randomly using the chart works. To put this into perspective, one of our players is addicted to making characters. It's his favorite thing in the world to do. Once he discovered Conan and saw that he could do it just using random die rolls, he decided to put it to the test. And he proceeded to make 20 characters back to back all using the random generation method, and every single one of them worked. The chapter also gives us step-by-step -step examples, walking us through the entire process. It is wonderful. Mechanics. When I first reviewed the quick start rules, I described the mechanics as running a razor's edge between intuitively simple and dauntingly complex, and I still feel that way, but let me go ahead and give you a very simplified breakdown of it. Characters have seven characteristic stats, and under each of those, several skills. Players add the stat to the skill. In this case, let's say we have an agility of 9 and a stealth of 2. That gives us a total of 11. There's also a category here called focus, which once you start your character at the beginning is the same as the level, so that's going to start off as 2. I do not know why focus and level are done separately. It makes no sense and is just kind of confusing, but... That's a rant for something else. A player then rolls 2d20 if they want to perform a stealth action, and they want to roll this number of 11 or lower. They then count the number of successes, so if the die rolled their focus or lower, which in this case is 2, that roll counts as 2 successes. So in theory, with 2 die, a player could get anywhere between 0 and 4 successes any time they try a skill roll. Now we get this great chart of examples of how many successes for different tasks might require, one being considered average difficulty. 
if we get more successes than we actually need to perform an action, such as we only needed one success, but we got three successes instead, those remaining two successes in that case become what's called momentum. Momentum can be spent on increased effects or other things. Momentum can also be stored in a pool that the rest of the players in the group can draw from. The momentum mechanic worked great for us because it encouraged all of our players to work together very often. One of the characters would go at the beginning of the round and he'd do whatever he could to build up enough momentum. That way the more effective characters could then use those successes to make more effective attacks during a combat round or whatever it was that we were doing. Out of all the RPGs that we have ever played, nothing has ever encouraged this much teamwork regularly as the group momentum pool has. In addition to what a character can do with their regular skill, each skill also has possible traits that the character can pick up and add to that. These are kind of like feats that you'd find in D&D or other games like that, and they're earned in trees, such as Persuade here with its own talent tree. Because there's several talents that are available per skill, that means we can have a lot of diversity as far as what characters can do. Even if all those characters on the surface all own the same initial skills, the actual talents that they build on and grow from can become pretty varied between them. Now, Game Masters, they earn momentum as well when they're rolling, but in their case, it's called Doom. Doom does much of the same stuff as momentum and it can be spent to bring more challenging stuff to our heroes. Now, some reviewers have commented that Doom can create sort of an adversarial aspect to the game where you know, Game Master is now giving you know, free reign to go against the players. Personally, I don't see it that way at all, and the game agrees. It specifically states that the Game Master isn't an adversary to them. In a normal RPG, if the players are having you know, too easy of a time with it, I might add a little bit more. I might have some new bad guys come running into a room, or I might cause some new and exciting danger to appear in the game, you know, keeping it challenging and fun for all my players. In Conan, all it's doing is it's adding a monetary system where the Game Master is forced to buy these things rather than just kind of doing them at will. And what I found is that as a Game Master, I'm less likely to actually arbitrarily throw in a bunch of new obstacles if I have to buy them using my Doom. Because now it's a limited resource and I might want to be saving some of my Doom for later on in the scenario so we can have a big finale. So my experience is that Doom actually limits adversarial Game Masters from just arbitrarily throwing in all sorts of new challenges whenever they want. But it also reminds Game Masters that they should be throwing in different challenges and whatnot for their players. So it's a good job of helping Game Masters throw in the challenges, but actually keeping that reined in so they don't run away with it. Modiphius missed a golden opportunity here to call the Game Masters of this game DMs, which stands for Doom Master, which is arguably way cooler. Complications. Now when a player rolls their d20, if any of those die come up showing a 20, that means a complication has occurred. That means they might fall down and drop their weapon, accidentally spill their drink when they're trying to impress a lord, or something else that just complicates the situation. It's also very possible that a hero might succeed at the task that they were attempting, you know, getting enough successes that they were able to pull it off, but they also have a complication. This means it worked, but it now has a couple drawbacks to it, like they, they did manage to pick the lock, but they broke their lock picks, or maybe they damaged the lock in the process, so now somebody's gonna know that it was picked, or maybe they tried to jump that ravine and they successfully made it across, but now they're hanging off the far edge and it's exciting as they have to pull themselves back up. Now one big wish that I had with this rulebook is that each of the skills that were presented in it was accompanied with kind of a short list of a possible complications or different ideas for complications that game masters could kind of draw from, get some ideas from, as well as kind of gauge what would be considered fair for a complication with that each individual skill that the characters are trying to use. Combat. Action scenes in combat are a lot of fun, but also a bit more complicated with a lot of terminology that can get confusing, but I'm going to go and try to give you a simpler explanation for it. Characters have two types of hit points. Physical, which is your physical damage, and mental, which is your sanity and morale, and I really dig the way they made them separate but completely equal in their importance. Under each of those is two subtypes. One is sort of a temporary hit points, like a pool that replenishes every scene, and the other is their real hit points, or harms, as they're called in this game. So we have two types of hit points, each with two categories underneath them, which means we essentially have four pools of hit points. The larger temporary pool is based off of the character's stats, you know, physical stats for physical damage, mental stats for mental damage, and these are more like the regular hit points that you'll find in games out there like Dungeons and Dragons, where uh, it doesn't matter if you are your max hit points or if you only have one left, 
Minecraft, you're still working at peak performance the whole time, as long as you have something in there. And your character operates at the same level, and those hit points can be replenished or healed very, very easily throughout the course of the adventure. Now, the real hit points, the harms, those are a completely different matter. You only get five harms per category, and each time that you lose a harm, all tasks, whether mental or physical, are going to become difficult by one step. So if normally an action would require you have a single success, but now you have one harm that now requires two successes, or if you have two harms that now requires three successes, so on and so forth, i.e. the death spiral. The more harms you get, the less effective your character becomes in the game. These harms are actually very hard to replenish, and when you run out of them, that's when your character is going to die. Describing this mechanic makes it sound a lot more complicated than it really is when you start using it, but I find it really cool. In games like D&D, you've got sort of a pool of hit points, and once you run out of your hit points, your character drops, but they're operating at 100% the whole way. Then you have other games that give you the death spiral, which really raises the stakes, because as the character is becoming more injured, it becomes harder and harder for them to stay in the fight. They're losing their efficiency. But what Conan did is it actually managed to bring both of those together, and it works very, very well. The only problem that I have here is all the word salad of all the different terms that you have to use uh, in order to keep combat straight with all the different hit points and maneuvers, and that starts making it difficult just due to the terminology. Oh yeah, we have stress, harms, vigor, resolve, wounds, and trauma. That is six terms just to describe hit points, and by crom, it gets confusing. It works, but it's still really confusing. The confusion only gets worse throughout the combat section because not only do we have all these now different types of damage and maneuvers, both physical and mental, that the player characters can attempt, the book gives virtually no examples on how to use them. We go through this long combat section that doesn't have any examples to the end, and we're awarded with a single example combat that's over a page long. But it's virtually useless because it wastes so much time giving me a little story about these characters that I don't care about, and only covers part of a combat rather than a full combat or a significant portion of a combat. The lack of examples became a regular problem in the rulebook. I mean, it starts off so great with character creation giving you small, step-by-step -step examples the whole way through it. And then once we get to the actual meat of the game and where the mechanics are, the rulebook's just like, eh, you got this, and just stops helping you. Short examples to be given throughout the combat chapter would have really helped me with not just learning the game, but helping us out in the middle of a session when somebody has a question about how some specific mechanic in combat works. We could easily check it, and right there would be an example that could help us out and get us back to the game faster. However, instead, we get this single long saga that's more focused on telling us a little short story about some random characters that I know nothing about, uh, rather than actually explaining the rules of what the rule book is. And this is a huge criticism that I have for Conan because it continues throughout the rest of the book. But before I move on from combat, I do have to say that the mental attacks option where uh, players can crush their enemy's will and morale is absolutely awesome. You know, the ability to cut off an enemy's head and hold it up to mentally damage the rest of your enemies is absolutely fantastic. It is one of the most Conan things I've ever read in a game. Now, damage is done with D6, referred to as combat dice. But instead of listing damage as so many D6 or so many CD, they use this little phoenix symbol instead of calling him CD. So a broadsword does five phoenixes of damage, while a cutlass does four phoenixes of damage, which is just weird. I don't know why they did that. Now, combat dice, they don't do a d6 worth of damage. Uh, instead, when you roll them, if you roll a one or a two, that means you do one or two points of damage, while a three and four are equal to zero points of damage, and five or six are both equal to one point of damage, but also activate any special effects that the weapon can do. Now, as goofy as this sort of mechanic sounds, or you're rolling dice and you're not actually going by the face value, my players absolutely loved it. However, they didn't like going through the mental hurdles of, you know, rolling a handful of d6, and it's like, okay, we count this one, we don't count this one, this one counts, but doesn't count for the face value that's on it. Uh, one of my players went ahead and made all of us custom combat dice, and these are some of mine. And each of them has a one, a two, and two blank sides, and then the effects are done as a picture of my mustache Mike character. They're really cool, and I just like showing them off. The next thing in combat that I find weird is zones. Essentially, these are the distances for either travel or missile weapon range during combat. And instead of saying that you can move or fire a bow X number of feet, 
they use the vaguely defined unit of measurement that's called zones. Things like terrain can separate a zone. So if you have a character who's in a clearing, and then you have a creek that's going through the clearing, and it's got like kind of a three foot deep trench to a trickle of water, and then there's an enemy on the opposite side of the creek, that enemy is now considered to be in a separate zone because the creek is acting as a physical barrier that might slow a character down if they were to run and hit them with their sword or their axe or something. And that's all well and good if zones only affected movement, but an arrow doesn't give two hoots about what the terrain looks like. But since rain Ranged weapons like bows and crossbows and slings are all done in zones, it makes no sense at all that whatever obstacles are inhibiting foot traffic should also reduce the range of an arrow. And this is all completely separate than cover. This is merely the distance that a missile weapon can travel. Modifius really goes out of their way not to give us any sort of unit or measurement throughout the whole rulebook uh, when it concerns like how far somebody can run or how fast they can run or what any of the weapon ranges are. And I think it just makes it more difficult to use in any of the rules. Now I've read forums and different arguments for zones trying to explain them away to me, but I don't buy any of them. Uh, to me it feels like the game was trying just really hard to be different than other games, uh, but they failed to take into account if they were making it better than any other games out there. Uh, they're just making it different for different sake. It is goofy and weird and I don't like zones. Now maybe if they'd given me some examples in the rule book and how to use zones, maybe a little map with somebody trying to show the different zones around them in relation to everything like that, uh, maybe I'd be able to understand it better, and maybe I'd say that, yeah, sure, it works. Uh, but since they didn't give us any examples, they didn't find them to be necessary and I have to go by their description, I don't like them. So for our game, we just ruled that a zone was kind of somewhere between 30 and 50 feet, unless there was some uh, physical obstruction or something that prevented it from going that far. In addition to that, because weapon range for bows and crossbows is just described as being close, medium, or long as far as relation to zones, this leads to a few goofy things, like a hunting bow now has the exact same range and damage as a thrown dagger. Because you know, why bother even hunting with a bow when a dagger works just as good? Sorcery in Conan is cool. Much of it is alchemy with sorcerers making powders and whatnot, and individual spells are treated like skills. The magic system is cool, but it doesn't really feel complete. Again, this could have used some more examples to help players and game masters out. So anyone that's interested in incorporating more magic into their Conan game, um, they should also consider picking up a copy of the book of Scalos. This is the magic book, and I consider it a close to being an essential for anyone that's wanting to do a longer Conan game. Carousing is another area that I really like in Conan, which is the adventures or misadventures that our heroes encounter in the space between their regular adventures. It's one of those elements that really gives the feel of Howard's stories and offers some great hooks or jumping off points for future gaming sessions. The rest of the book has got character profiles for some of the more notable Conan characters, our heroes and our villains from all of Howard's stories. We also get a sample adventure, The Vultures of Shim, which I always appreciate sample scenarios in core book. So huge thank you, Modifius, for adding that in there. I do have a separate review available for that scenario. We also get several monsters and foes to sprinkle into our own adventures, profiles on many of the cities and lands. It is all wonderful and again really gives us that feeling of Howard's world. But then we get to a section that's just characters that were made for Kickstarter backers and it's 30 pages of characters made for Kickstarter backers and it feels a bit much, especially if a book's already over 400 pages long to then just add 30, 30 pages worth of other characters that I don't care about. I mean, the actual characters for the ones from Howard's story, like Conan and Thulsa Doom, that section only took up 10 pages. Ease of use. One of the biggest criticisms that I have about Conan is the book itself. While beautiful, it's not the easiest book to use. In fact, it's the most difficult book that I've ever found to use during a game session. I mentioned the inconsistency with the examples, you know, how the beginning of the book had rich, rich examples and they just walked you through it and I thought it was wonderful and then they just kind of stopped all together. Um, several sections felt like they were pretty much written as if it expected the reader to already know what the rules are. And this is just kind of a, a refresher course rather than being written as a way to teach the rules to somebody that's never played this game before. Momentum spins, which the players and game masters are going to be using a lot, are not all listed in one place, which makes it really inconvenient for a player to quickly look down and see what options they have to be able to spin their momentum on. I could go on and on with this section and just drag the video down, so I'm just going to give you a couple quick examples of what I'm talking about as far as how difficult this book is to use in-game. Bows that are listed have three types that, aside from availability, appear completely identical 
range, damage, size, qualities, it's all the same. To find the difference between these bows, you need to read this uh, section on bow descriptions, and in this wall of text, you'll discover how a horse bow can be used from horseback without penalty. But to find that information, you have to go through this big paragraph. That's all fine and good if you're sitting on your couch reading a rule book, but if you're in the middle of a game and your player is trying to find that rule that they read that says that they don't have a penalty if they're firing this bow from a horse, and now they're flipping back and forth in the book, just trying to find that information about it because uh, there's nowhere that clearly states it, that really drags the game down. And this could have easily been solved if they just either use bold text or bullet points. Another is guard, where a character can get up under his opponent's weapon and get their stabby stabby on. We have a section explaining it, a section showing how to regain guard, but neither says how one would go about breaking the guard of their enemy. To find that, you just have to notice it here, buried in the momentum spins, showing that it costs two momentum. But how hard would it have been just to put that in the initial description when you're talking about guard? Just a single sentence that says, oh, to break guard it costs two momentum, rather than forcing the reader to hunt through the book for a chart that's five pages away, one sentence that's all it would have taken. These sound like a bunch of nitpicky little gripes, but please understand that there are a lot of things like this in this book, and it becomes the death of a thousand cuts as players and game masters are always having to stop the game and search the book, flipping back and forth, trying to find some rule that shouldn't be that difficult to find. How does my character break God should not become the riddle of steel. All of my players mentioned at some point or another while we were playing Conan how maddeningly difficult this core book was to navigate, and how this is the worst one that they've ever seen, and all but one of my players have over 20 years with their tabletop experience across a, across a wide range of various games, so they're pretty versed in different rule books and rule systems over a long period of time. Now the one player that I have that doesn't have 20 years worth of experience, he owns a CPA firm, and as he put it, it's easier for him to navigate the US tax code system than it is for him to navigate the Conan core book. Accessories. While the core book does contain more or less all that you need to get a Conan game running, there are a few accessories that you can pick up as well. I mentioned the book of Scalos, now I consider it a must-have for sorcerer players, though it still doesn't give good examples of offerings and ingredients, which I do find a bit annoying. There's also Conan the Thief, which is a beautiful book. I don't know what it is about that red cloak that just draws my eye every time, but I love this cover art. And it expands on thieving options, new archetypes, and provides more detailed information on several cities where thieves are known to be. And it's a good book, but it's not essential. Conan the Mercenary is a great book, giving us once again more archetype packages and some great detailed information expanding on several other cities and regions. I found this book to be very useful for our campaign. Jeweled Thrones of the Earth is a collection of seven adventures. I have run and reviewed two of these adventures, and from what I've been told, the PDF has been updated uh, in regards to some of my complaints that I had about one of those adventures. While I do like the book, my biggest complaint is that the adventures that are inside of it really don't do Conan justice. Being a skill-based game with so much to offer and as far as, you know, social or non-combat related skills, the adventures in this book kind of feel more dungeon crawling and more like an old D&D adventure than they do for something worthy of Conan. And I would have loved more diversity in the books, kind of showing off what this game is capable of and teach game masters and players all the different options that are now available to them using the system. And I kind of feel like they dropped the ball on that because they could have given us something better. Their game master screen is also pretty nice. It's also extremely heavy duty. This is probably the thickest Game Master screen that I've ever encountered, um, but it's also the only product that I picked up from Modiphius that didn't just come with a free PDF already included, which by the way, any of the books, if you buy them directly from the Modiphius website, they send you the PDF to go along with it. So I recommend that if you are going to purchase any of the Conan hardbacks, go ahead, get it from the Modiphius website and get the PDF while you're there. Q Workshop has made some dice sets for Conan with specially marked D6 and hit low location dice. It's okay. The hit location die is the only one that I found worth it, but I wish it was a bit larger and easier to read because it's the same size as a regular d20 and it makes it a little difficult to read, you know, which hit location it was in such a small die. And if not that, I wish it was a different color than the other d20 because when you glance down at your table and you're grabbing d20, you're very likely to grab that one by mistake because at a glance it looks identical to the other two d20. Now one book that I haven't picked up is Nameless Cults, which goes into the gods of the world, so I can't tell you how good of a book it 
it is, but one complaint that I have about the core book is while it does give a lot of great information and detail about the world, it gives us nothing at all about the gods. Which makes playing a priest character kind of difficult to do, not having any information about the god that you're supposed to be a priest of. Now thankfully the Conan world is known enough that we are able to find some outside information about Mitra and Ishtar and all those and how they should be worshipped, but I really wish the core book had put some sort of information about the gods that are of this world. Now maybe they could have found room for it in the core book had they not spent 30 pages on Kickstarter characters. Character sheets. I don't think I've ever really criticized the character sheets in any other my system reviews that I've done, but Conan does have a few things that I want to mention. From this pretty colored character sheet to a black and white version of it, which both go through links to make them very pretty, but end up becoming difficult to use. We have a lot of wasted space with the border here, a border which at time encroaches on the portion that the players should write in, which is most evident when you look at the back half of the sheet. There's also this basic version of the sheet, but it still has a few problems. One is grip that's listed under weapons. Grip isn't explained at all in the book. I've done a search of the PDF. I can't find that term anywhere. We have no idea what this is supposed to be used for. Uh, there's already a space that denotes if the weapon is to be one-handed or two-handed, so that's not what it's for. And finally, we decided it meant if it was going to be held in your right hand or your left hand, which seems like a really weird thing to take up space on the character sheet for. Uh, so that's what we finally guessed it's for. I don't know. To me, it feels like it's an artifact from kind of a, a previous edition of the game, and they're still putting it together, and they just never took it off the character sheet. But two things that do not appear in the character sheet that I wish were on there is fatigue and despair, which the book does make a big deal out of and how a character has to track what their fatigue and despair is, but then it gives us nowhere in the character sheet to track it. Normally little stuff like this is not going to irritate me. It's nothing that I'm actually going to waste my time discussing in one of my videos, but you know how when something is already irritating you and every other little thing that adds on to it just makes that you know annoyance worse and worse? This character sheet does that for me. While aesthetically pretty, those aesthetics seem to have a higher priority over its functionality. We have parts that aren't explained at all, leaving you wondering if you missed something and you now you have to check the book to see what you missed. And other parts that you know are important, it gives you zero help in trying to implement them. And that's how I feel about the core book itself. We have a lot of wasted space in the core book. Uh, sometimes it's taking you know, an entire paragraph to explain something that you could have done in just a single sentence. Things aren't laid out in a way that's easy for the eye to follow, and you spend a lot of time thinking, did I miss something? So I guess what you're just trying to say is that you don't like this game. Not at all. My players absolutely had a blast with Conan. It was a huge hit with our group. I cannot stress how big of a hit it was with them. I already showed you the dice that they made, but here's the doom and momentum chips that they made, as well as fortune point counters. I had this little bowl that I dropped the doom chips in. It was a hell of a lot of fun. Game Masters, I highly recommend you picked up some sort of chips or something like that to represent doom and momentum and drop them in bowls for dramatic effect. It is really, really fun. All of my players now own copies of the hardback book. That's why I've got two of them, because one of them is my wife's. My players loved it so much they now all have a copy of the book. That doesn't happen with most games that we play, but at the same time, every single one of my players then mentioned how difficult this book was to use. Ultimately, the biggest failing with this game was for me as a game master, I've never gotten fully comfortable with the rules of Conan. You know, normally it takes a few sessions for me to kind of ease myself into it and become really comfortable with it. I might not know all the rules to the game, you never know all the rules to any particular game, but you're at least comfortable in your understanding of them, that you can make a snap decision judgment call and keep the game running and you're not worried that you're actually uh, doing something that the game shouldn't really allow. But I never got that comfortable with Conan. I was always kind of worried that this wasn't how the game was supposed to work. I was always a little bit confused and a little bit hesitant in my understanding of the rules. Now, that might just be me. Uh, other game masters out there might not have that problem at all. But for me and my group, that became a huge problem. I did make some cheat sheets for our group, so link below if you'd like to have a copy of my cheat sheet. The problems that I have with Conan aren't enough that I wouldn't recommend this to people. But instead of you know telling players and game masters that if they want a skill-based game that just drips style and is really incorporated into the Howard world. Instead of that, I really encourage that anybody that thinks they might be interested in Conan to go out and pick up the uh, two copies of the free quick start guides that are out there uh, that comes with two free sample adventures. Uh, pick those up, play through them, see how you like it. And once you've done that, go ahead and determine at that point if you think that Conan is something that you should purchase and continue with. So, in conclusion, 
Conan is a game that has a lot to offer, but it just isn't for everybody. Unfortunately, it's not for some of the people that it should have been for. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, like Game Master Toolbox and RPG reviews, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, you forgot to mention how the soundtracks for Conan the Destroyer and Conan the Barbarian should just be played on a non-stop loop during the entirety of your gaming sessions. I mean, it's not actually in the rulebook, but if you read between the lines, you'll see it.